Let's get into God's word now. If you brought a Bible, please open it to 1 John chapter 1. That is where we are going to unpack this first element of a message series that we are calling All Hail the King. We want Christmas at Christ Church to be marked by a joyful reception and recognition of Jesus Christ as the King. And we're going to do that by celebrating four elements of his kingship uh, during four weeks of celebration here. And we're going to meditate upon Jesus as the eternal King, the promised King, as the humble King, and the returning King. And this week, we're going to begin with Jesus as the eternal king from 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Well, I suppose at this point, you'd have to be living under a rock to be unaware of the fact that Elon Musk bought Twitter. Now, I was thinking about that statement, and I was sort of confronted with the reality that I think that might be a happy rock to live under. Anyone else feel like that? Anyone else just feel like, hey, I think my life would actually be better if I was unaware of all of this ridiculous stuff going on in the larger world? It's the kind of stuff that makes me think like, I could probably go move to a ranch in Wyoming and never talk to another human again and just my wife and my kids and raise cows and have corn and stuff like that and it would be great. That would probably be a nice uh, way to live, but we are not afforded that option as followers of Jesus. (laughs) And here's what I was thinking. I was actually thinking about the fact this week that This is such a massive, notable, global event that it feels like everyone in the world is aware that it has happened. It's plastered all over every web page on the internet. It's the topic of conversation on a regular basis. Like you can't turn anywhere without this fact and this event being mentioned. But when I really stop to think about it, I am reminded of the reality that it bears zero impact on my daily life. Now, that is in part because I'm not an active Twitter user. I think I made an account in like 2013. I think I've tweeted twice in the last nine years. And yet, even if you are an active Twitter user, I'm willing to wager that the fact that he bought it hasn't changed your experience really at all. I live my day-to-day life, and I relate to my wife and to my kids, and I go to work, and I do the things that God has called me to do, and there is no bearing on my existence because this thing has happened and everyone knows about it. And my fear for us as we approach this Christmas season is that we will treat Christmas a little bit like that. That everybody knows that it happened and it's a part of the cultural consciousness and everybody is talking about it and celebrating it and we're going to give gifts and it's going to be all over the internet and it's going to be the topic of our conversations and we're going to travel and we're going to do all of this stuff because everybody's aware that this big event has happened and yet we will treat it as irrelevant for our daily lives. We will pretend as if it's a way out there, maybe a faraway fairy tale or an irrelevant data point, and it will not infiltrate and change and transform our daily lives the way that it should. And what I want to show you today from 1 John chapter 1 is that if the Christmas story is true, if what the Bible tells us happened when Jesus came to earth, that this is the eternal God who took on human flesh and became like us so that he could live in our place a perfectly righteous life, so that he could die on the cross as a substitute for sinners like you and me, and so that he could rise from the dead in resurrection power to grant the gift of eternal life to all those who trust in him and to rescue them forever, if that's actually what happened at Christmas, then it should change everything about every day of your life. It should not be an irrelevant, far away event that we talk about and think about, but do not live. It should alter and revolutionize and change every part of our lives, if it's actually true. That's the big idea this morning. It's this, life is altered now because the baby of Bethlehem is the eternal king. This is what we're going to see portrayed in this first paragraph of John's epistle. He's gonna tell us that the one who was born in the manger, the one that we celebrate at Christmas that he is no mere earthly figure, that he is not only a baby, that he is, in fact, the king of eternity, that he is the timeless one, the ever-existent one who stepped into time and space in order to rescue us. 
That's what John is going to tell us. And I'm just here to represent to you today that if that is actually true, it should change everything about your life. The way you live, the way you speak, the way you think, the relationships you carry on, how you relate to God, everything is altered right now because Jesus arrived. And I want to show you that from 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The Apostle John writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Life is altered. Life is transformed. Life is changed now because the baby of Bethlehem is the eternal king. You would do well to ask the question, how in the world does the arrival of Jesus affect my life? What's different for me right now because this great event happened? How should it alter my life? And here's how we're going to answer. We're going to show you from the text two major implications of the arrival of the eternal king, Jesus. And we'll unpack them like this. Because Jesus is the eternal king, because the baby of Bethlehem is the king of eternity, here are two major implications. First, because Jesus is the eternal king, I can know God personally. I can know God personally. We're jumping into the very first words of a letter that was written by the Apostle John, the same author as the gospel we have been studying. This was written much later in his life, and it was written to a group of Christians who were suffering, Christians who were going through hard circumstances, and Christians whose confidence was deeply shaken specifically because there were people in their Christian community who had abandoned Christ and walked away. And Pastor John, who's leading these churches, is going to write this letter to them to give them assurance and to give them confidence that they really belong to Jesus, that they are genuine believers. And he's going to begin that letter attempting to give them confidence by centering on what the whole letter will be about, which he calls the word of life. Now he begins by saying that which was from the beginning, and he ends that section of the sentence saying concerning the word of life. Now those two phrases in particular, if you know the gospel of John, should sound like a very familiar echo of how John began his gospel. He said, in the beginning was the word. And in the very first sentence of this epistle, he does almost the exact same thing. That which was from the beginning concerning the word of life. So what he's going to revolve this entire letter around is what he revolved his entire gospel around. I would argue it's probably the only thing he ever cared to talk to anyone about, which is the eternal God of heaven and earth who took on flesh and whose name is Jesus. He calls him the word, and here in in this epistle, the word of life. Now, he says, from the beginning, that which was from the beginning, and that should give you you the sense, just like John 1, 1 did, in the beginning, he's talking about someone or something that transcends time. He's talking about an eternal reality. He's talking about before the beginnings began. Before there was time, before there was space, there was what? The word of life. The same word that was with God and was God. The same word that in John 1.14 took on flesh. Now what comes next after describing something that is eternal, what's so shocking is what he says after the comma. That which was from the beginning. So we're talking about something eternal, something transcendent. And then he says, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands. Jesus said, John says, this eternal reality we have perceived with our physical senses. 
Now, if you could stop for a moment and kind of withdraw yourself from the familiarity of the story, think about how shocking this is. He's describing an entity that is eternal and transcendent, that is beyond time, that has always existed. And I don't know about you, but when I think of something like that, I think of a low likelihood that I could hold that in my hands, that I could experience that with my finite sensory perception, and yet that's exactly what John is saying. The eternal one, we saw him, we heard him, and we touched him. We were able to interact with him with our physical senses. And he sums all that up in the beginning of verse two by saying the life, that word of life was made manifest. Which means this, it means that the invisible God of eternity has become visible and temporal. That the God who is transcendent and unreachable and far away has come so near that he was born just like us. That the, the God who spoke everything into existence has now entered the creation that he was responsible for. And this is a, this is a stunning reality. The reality of this Christmas story, it shatters the often held misconception about God that we might call deism, which is simply this, that if there is a God, he created the world and then he stepped back from it so he could be uninvolved with it. The common illustration used is like a, like a watchmaker who created a watch and wound it up and then stepped away from it and allows the world to kind of carry on in its own natural processes but has no intention of intervening or being involved in it. That's a very common perception of God. Because of the brokenness of the world and yet the transcendence that we experience, we think, well, there must be a God, but if he exists, he probably doesn't care about what's going on here. And these verses, they obliterate that misconception. Because these verses tell us that we serve a God who is not content to remain far away from that which he created, who is not content to be uninvolved and unengaged, but who cares and desires to be intimately involved and closely connected with the world that he created and the individuals that make it up. He cares so much to be involved that he stepped down from his eternal power and glory and comfort that he enjoyed for all time. And in the second person of the Trinity, he took on human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ so that he could be with us, he could be like us, and he could die for us to save us. That is an amazing, eternity-altering, life-transforming truth. Because here's what it means. Here's what it means. And this is what the apostles care to proclaim. It means that in Jesus Christ, God has become near and knowable. That God is not interested in stiff arming you and keeping you far away from him. That God is not looking for somebody who's better than you are that God is actually interested and willing to sacrifice to great lengths to have a personal relationship with you. That's what this means. Now, when someone is being interviewed for something like citizenship or a very important promotion or the one that came to mind was uh, trying to join the FBI, what, what happens is there's these like massive firms that they hire that will go and do extensive background research on the particular candidate and they will dig so far into their past that they will interview like their third grade teacher and ask them, how were they in third grade? Were they amenable to the productivity of the class? Were they setting things on fire in the garbage can in the corner? What were they doing? What were they like? They will dig in, and what, here's what they do. They find people who are close enough to the candidate to provide an accurate testimony of what they're actually like. It's called a character witness. Perhaps you've seen this in a court case. When somebody stands trial, you get a character witness, someone who is close enough to them to testify to what they are like. 
And what Pastor John is doing here by telling you, Jesus took on flesh and we saw him and we heard him. He's telling you, I am close enough to be a reliable character witness to who Jesus is and what he's all about. And here's what I'm testifying to you. Look at what it says. We've seen it, we've heard it, we testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life. He's, he says, I was close enough to Jesus to know for sure and to proclaim this message to you that God loves you and wants to welcome you into the life that only he can offer. This is what Christmas means for you and for me, that God has not stayed far away from us. God has come near to us and wants to be known by us. That is that is a message worth celebrating at Christmas. Jesus is the eternal king, and yet he was born as the baby in Bethlehem so that we can know God personally. This is a reminder, I don't know about you, but this is a reminder I need so often. It is so tempting for me to just constantly treat God like a, like a theological concept to understand or like an important job to do, and not like a person to be known. But that's what these verses, and that's what the Christmas story is telling us about the nature and character of God, that he is a personal God, and that he's a God that desires relationship with those he created. So I don't know what you walked in this room thinking about God this morning, but these verses should be a clear and compelling reminder to you that God wants to know you. He wants to know you. And he wants to know you so badly that he took on human flesh to be like you and he gave his life on the cross to save you and he rose from the grave to give you the gift of eternal life. And this is what the apostle is proclaiming. So maybe you think, well, Nick, that sounds great. I would love a personal relationship with God, but I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how to cultivate a personal relationship with God. And sometimes I think we overcomplicate it. I think we kind of instinctively understand what it takes to build a personal relationship with another person. And building a relationship with God, of course it's different because he's the God of the universe, but it's not unlike what it looks like to build a close friendship or a marriage. It involves many of the same things. So if you want a relationship with God, but you don't know what it looks like, I would just begin by asking you, do you want a relationship with God, truly? Like not, not just in this fleeting moment, like, well, yeah, I guess it would be nice to have a relationship with God, but do you desire it enough to pursue it? Because I'm telling you, if you want to date someone or have a strong friendship or build a great relationship with your kids, it is not enough to have a fleeting desire for that relationship. You must take the time and the energy and the effort and the emotion to pursue that relationship or it will never exist. And the same thing is true with you and God. It starts with a desire. Do you want to know him and have a relationship with him? And does that desire ever move you to carve out time to spend with him? Do you ever get quiet in his presence and just listen to him? Do you open the word and allow him to speak to you? Do you talk back to him in prayer and develop your affections for him and commit to obey him and desire to live for him? Do any of those things happen in your daily life? Because the message of Christmas is telling us that that is possible for you, that you can set aside time and energy and you can give it to seeking a relationship with God and you will find he is not hiding from you, he's revealing himself to you. He's not running away from you, he's inviting you into relationship. So my plea to you today and on this, in this Christmas season would be to actually Take the steps and set aside the time and the energy to know God personally. Develop a relationship with him. The luxury and the benefit and the blessing that has been afforded to you because the baby of Bethlehem is the eternal king. It should change your life and it should do it right now. Because Jesus is the eternal king, I can know God personally. Here's the second major implication. Because Jesus is the eternal king, I can experience hope practically. I can experience hope practically. 
Verse three says, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. The mark of the apostolic ministry The men that Jesus called, the 12 men that he gathered around him, entrusted his life to, taught, trained, empowered, and then sent out on the gospel mission. The mark of their mission was proclamation. This was the function of the apostles, to be the first-hand witnesses, seen him, heard him, touched him, was around him, received by the power of the Holy Spirit, all of his teaching, and then what? Went out into the world and proclaimed the message of what was different because Jesus arrived and lived and died and rose again. Their ministry is a ministry of proclamation. He says, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. They went out to proclaim in the midst of a dark and broken and dying world a message of hope, a message that the king of heaven had come to the earth and that through his life, death, and resurrection, he had inaugurated the arrival of his kingdom and the day was coming one day when he would renew all things and bring them under subjection to his good and kind rule and he would judge the living and the dead and set all things right and rule and reign forever in a new heavens and a new earth. This is a proclamation of hope to the world that desperately needs it. And here in this proclamation, what we see are three elements of this hope that are uniquely available to you and to me because of the arrival of the eternal king. And we see them right after the so that. So he says, we're proclaiming this to you. And you might ask, why are you proclaiming it? And he tells you with crystal clarity so that these three things would happen. He talks about unity with one another, relationship with God, and complete joy. First, look at unity with one another. He says, so that you too may have fellowship with us. There are many circumstances and many situations in our lives that would breed despair in us. And I can think of few things that compound the suffering and the difficulty of despair, like isolation, like being by yourself, like having no one to support you and care for you and hold your arms up when you're exhausted and love you and walk the road with you. And yet we live in a world, especially in our culture, that just loves to isolate people. We are a highly individualistic culture where we push everyone else away and all that matters is me and myself and my pursuits and how I feel. And what John is saying here is that the first element of hope is that you are not alone. You're not alone. You don't have to walk the road alone. He says, I'm proclaiming this to you so that you may have fellowship with us. That word fellowship is not just like superficial friendship. It's not drink punch and eat cookies in the church lobby. This is partnership. This is, this is a deep and abiding spiritual bond through a common faith in Jesus. This is that by the work of the Holy Spirit, we have been knit together as the body of Christ in the family of God, and we can walk the road together no matter what it looks like. That's fellowship with us, with God's people. So when you are tempted to despair and when things get difficult, I think one of the greatest means of grace that God has supplied for you is one another. That when, when life is hard and your circumstances are burdensome and you feel like giving up, you can look to your right and to your left and you can find fellow believers who will look you in the face and say, you're not giving up today. God is good and I know it. And even if you don't believe it in this moment, I will believe it on your behalf and I will link arms with you and we will walk together all the way. I don't know about you, but I need that. This is why it seems so absurd to me when people are like, well, I'm a Christian, but I just don't care about the church. I'm like, who is going to help you when your life is in the ditch? John says, one of the reasons we're proclaiming this and one of the reasons you can have hope is because we can have fellowship together. It doesn't mean we have to have common interests and be best friends and love each other. It means we are radically committed to one another because we are the family of God and the body of Christ. 
and nothing can break our bond with one another. That's hope inducing. This is practical hope that you are not alone. You have brothers and sisters in Christ. But the significance and the substance of that relationship is dependent on what is said next. Because if it was just that, if that stood in isolation, it sounds kind of prideful for John to say. John's like, listen, I'm proclaiming this amazing eternity altering message and here it is, you can be with me. And we're like, John, settle down a little bit. What do you mean? Like, why is that so important? Well, he tells us, and indeed our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. The reason that fellowship with one another really matters is that it is built on a common foundation of relationship with God. That's the only reason that true Christian fellowship matters, that it is a common relationship with God. And this is what he says. Our fellowship is with God the Father and with his Son. John has already told us in the, in the gospel that he wrote In John 17, verse three, he says, this is eternal life, that you know the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ. And he echoes that here and says, I'm welcoming you into the fellowship that we enjoy with God himself. The very reason that Jesus Christ came and lived and died is so that you and I could be reconciled to God and brought into a harmonious relationship with our creator. In spite of our rebellion, in spite of our sin, when we are covered by the blood of Jesus and made righteous according to his merit, we are welcomed into full and free and eternal relationship with the God who made us. And if we remember that that is true, if we will sit in the reality of our redemption, it will take us to verse four. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. There are all kinds of reasons in the world for you to be miserable, for you to be marked by sorrow and burdens and gloom and pessimism and despair. And yet, Pastor John, writing this epistle, says, I'm writing so that you can have fullness of joy. That's what complete joy means. It means there's no joy left to give. You have all the joy you could ever want. And I'm, I'm sure, I, I know, because it's a temptation of my own heart, so often I can be convinced, like, man, if all my circumstances were right, then I would have joy. And the problem is, there's been times in my life where I've gotten so many things right, and joy is still fleeting. Maybe you are a person, maybe you know someone who has got every circumstance in their life all dialed in. Their relationships are perfect. They got all kinds of money. They're healthy. They've got all of the circumstances and no joy. Why is that? It's because ultimately joy cannot be found in the superficial realities around us. It must be found in the supernatural realities in us. That's where joy is found. And so John says to us, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the God of eternity stepped down into creation and he became a baby so that he could give his life as a ransom for sinners. He rose from the dead so he could give you the gift of eternal life. God wants to know you and be in relationship with you. And what he's doing there is he's reminding you that the story of Christmas is the story of the dawn of eternal and indestructible joy. I mean, think about it. If you really believed and experienced that God loved you and sent his son to save you and that every single one of his promises were true for you, you could have joy no matter what your life looked like. And that's what hope is. That's why this is such an amazing message of hope. Maybe you think to yourself, like, yeah, the Christmas season, it's supposed to be all happy. It's supposed to be all chipper. There's the Hallmark movies and the sugar cookies and the turkey and the twinkly lights and the wreaths and the presents and all of the trappings, but I don't feel happy. Maybe you look around at all of the sparkly things about Christmas and they actually just make you angry because all you feel is grief and loss and burden. My encouragement to you today 
is that if you feel that way, if you feel despair today, that reality in your life is not evidence that you can't have hope. That is actually the backdrop upon which hope shines. I mean, think about it for a minute. The very definition of hope means that you cannot have hope if everything is perfect. You can't have it by definition. Hope only exists against the backdrop of things that are broken. Because what is hope? Hope is a confident expectation of good in the future because of the promises of God. That's true hope. So it means if you are in a hard situation, hope can shine, hope can live. Because that's what hope is, is it is a defiance of my circumstances and it is a rock solid, resolute confidence that God sees me, God knows me, God loves me, and God is doing good things for me no matter what happens. And the, the ultimate reality that stamps that upon my life is that Jesus Christ has come, that he is the baby at Bethlehem and he is the eternal king. And the practicality, the reality of that hope comes alive in my life. And this is my prayer for you today, that as you fight for hope, that it would not be a pie in the sky idea, but it would be a boots on the ground reality. If you have hope, it changes the way that you live. A man named Viktor Frankl during World War II, he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And he was a prisoner in a concentration camp. And he did a lot of introspection. He studied all of the other prisoners around him. And he saw some that wasted away and faded away and many who died. And he saw some that were resolute and courageous and who made it through. And even on the other side, who thrived. And he said that the difference between the two was hope. The difference between the two was a resolute commitment to look to the future with confidence in defiance of what their circumstance looked like. Those were the people who thrived. And my hope and prayer is that this Christmas season that that will be true of your life. That you will have hope because Jesus has arrived. And that that hope would not just be a feeling, but it would be a practical, everyday reality. I mean, think about it. If you have true hope, indestructible hope, eternal hope, it will change the words that you say. It will change the expression on your face at times. It will change the relationships you carry on. It will change the generosity that you give. It will change how you interact. It'll change your priorities. It'll change everything about you. That's what I hope and pray for you this season. Life is altered now because the baby of Bethlehem is the eternal king. If it's true, if that baby in the manger 2,000 years ago is the king of eternity, it changes everything about our lives. It means that we can know God personally and we can have hope practically My desire is that all of us would pursue that, a personal relationship with God and a practical expression of hope and that as we do, this Christmas season would be an opportunity for the light of the gospel to shine through our lives and an opportunity to testify to the goodness and faithfulness of our God who sent his very own son so that you and I together, the message and the banner of our lives in this season and well beyond is all hail the king, the king of eternity who was born in a manger to rescue you and me. Let's pray.